Today, we continue our discussion of anthropology, or the doctrine of human beings, with a consideration of human sin. As we discussed in the previous lesson, humans were originally created in a state of perfect goodness. There was no evil in God's original creation. Look around today, however, and you'll quickly realize that this is not the case. Alcoholism, sexual abuse, and domestic violence are just a few examples of how God's good creation has been corrupted. How did we get here from such a perfect start? This question is addressed in the doctrine of what is called the fall of human beings. Before we talk about where sin came from, however, it's helpful to define exactly what we mean by the word sin. Different cultures can have many different understandings of sin. For example, to some cultures, disrespect for elders is a great evil, but telling a lie is not really a big deal. For others, illicit sex is a terrible thing, but no one thinks twice about how to honor their grandparents or elders. Given this wide variety of understandings, how can we know exactly what sin is? Some have suggested that sin is not actually real at all. It is just an illusion created by society. It is not really a matter of right and wrong, but rather just something that is dictated to us by our culture. Others have said that sin is a matter of our own limitations of, as human beings. We fight and wage wars, for example, because the human race has not yet matured enough to overcome those aggressive tendencies. In Christian circles, sin is sometimes defined as selfishness. While it's true that selfishness is sin, not all sin is a simple matter of being selfish. Finally, we can sometimes define sin in legal terms as a violation of God's law. But it is possible to sin internally without actually breaking any laws, whether human or divine. So what is sin? A good, simple, biblical definition of sin is provided by Lewis Sperry Chafer. Sin is any lack of conformity to the character of God. Anything that we do that is not consistent with who God is, is sin. This is a good definition because it starts with God. It does not define sin in human terms. Sin is more than our own cultural norms or our human limitations. Moreover, this definition is all-inclusive. It does not focus on any single type of sin, such as selfishness or lawlessness. It covers anything we could think, say, or do. As we mentioned earlier, it's important to remember that God did not create sin. When God finished creating the universe, everything was very good, according to Genesis 1.31. There was no sin. That said, it is true that God created the potential to sin. God created personal beings who were moral agents. By creating good people, there was a natural capacity for evil. We could think of it in terms of light and darkness. God created light, but he did not need to create darkness. Darkness is simply the absence of light. In the same way, sin is the absence of goodness. If something is good, then there is the logical possibility of evil even if it does not actually exist in the world. These good people were given two specific responsibilities. First, they were to exercise dominion over creation. In other words, they were creation's caretakers appointed by God. As God's vice regents or servant kings, they were supposed to take care for and enjoy his creation. Second, they were specifically told to abstain from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis 2, 14-17, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. The account of humanity's fall into sin is recorded in Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it and your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
there are several things we can learn from this passage. First, we should observe that Adam and Eve were not the first sinners. Rather, the serpent, who is elsewhere revealed to be possessed by Satan, is already sinful, and here he leads Adam and Eve into sin. We will study Satan's origins further in a future lesson. Second, we should observe Satan's tactics. He addresses Eve, not Adam. In doing so, he is directly subverting God's creative order. We also see that God directly contradicts God's word. God had said, you will surely die. But Satan says, you surely will not die. Satan also questions God's goodness, making him look like the bad guy. In reality, God had given every tree to Adam and Eve as food except this one. But Satan makes it seem like every kind of fruit is outlawed. Finally, Satan distorts the truth. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. This was true, but not in a good way. If you think about these tactics, we can see how Satan still operates in these same ways. When we start questioning what God has said, reinterpreting his word, or wondering if he really has our best interests in mind, we should realize that we are on the path towards evil. Genesis 3.6 describes how Eve responded. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. Eve rationalized her sin. She thought through it and decided that in this case, it would be okay. Eve's thought process follows the same three categories of sin that are revealed in 1 John 2.16 the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride in possessions. First, she noticed that the tree was good for food, the desires of the flesh. This is good food. God would want me to enjoy it. Second, she observed that the fruit was a delight to the eyes. How could something this beautiful be bad? Finally, she saw that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She was proud. She wanted the same knowledge that God had. These three categories that Eve pioneered set the pattern for all our sins that follow. In the second half of this verse, verse 6, Adam comes into the picture. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. You might wonder, if Eve was the first to sin, then why is Adam always the one who is blamed? This verse explains why. Adam was present when Eve was being tempted. Her husband who was with her. Satan did not corner Eve while Adam was away on a hunting trip. They were together, and Adam did nothing to stop it. Adam had the responsibility to intervene, but he neglected this God-given role. This is why Adam is ultimately the one who is blamed for human sin. The sin of Adam and Eve resulted in a specific set of consequences. All of creation changed as a result of their choice. The first party to be judged was the serpent, who was the instrument of Satan. Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Since the serpent was an animal, not a moral agent, this judgment is largely symbolic. When people see the serpent slithering along in the grass, they are to be reminded of God's judgment of sin. More significant is God's judgment of Satan himself in verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God predicts a constant struggle between Satan and human beings. But in this prediction, in this darkest moment of humanity, there is a glimmer of hope. God also promises that eventually Satan would be defeated by the woman's seed. This seed was a specific person sometime in the future indicated by the pronoun he. He shall bruise 
your head. Evil would not reign forever. In verse 16, God pronounces judgment upon women. This judgment contains two notable components. First, great pain in childbirth. I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Second, God predicts a constant power struggle in the home between husband and wife. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. The desire here is not a good loving desire. It is a desire for power. The woman will want to wear the pants in the family, but the man will constantly beat her down and lord his authority over her. Notice that neither of these are condoned by God. They are simply the result of sin in the family. God's commands to husbands and wives in Ephesians 5 seem to be aimed specifically at undoing these harmful effects of the fall. Wives, submit to your husbands. Don't try to gain the upper hand or struggle with them for power. In the same way, husbands, love your wives. Don't try to rule over them or lord your power over them. So in the gospel, the effects of the curse in the family are undone. In verses 17 to 19, God's attention turns towards men. As a result of Adam's actions, we see that all of creation becomes corrupted. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. The result of this corruption of the earth itself is great pain and hardship for humanity. God's good creation which was originally intended to be a joy and delight for people to work, becomes a difficult chore. To cap off this long, toilsome life on earth, physical death becomes a reality for the human race. By the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Prior to sin, Adam and Eve were immortal. They did not face death. But even this consequence does not compare to the final act of judgment. Ultimately, humanity's sin resulted in separation from God's fellowship. In verses 24 to 25, Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden where they had enjoyed perfect fellowship with God, and an angelic guardian is appointed to bar the way from ever returning. Adam and Eve are cast out of God's presence condemned to a godless eternity, separated from him in hell.